John of Gaunt. I'm honoured, Lancaster. Hast thou, according to thy oath and ban, brought hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal, which then our leisure would not let us hear, against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appealed the Duke on ancient malice, or worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him, aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Then call them to our presence. Face to face and frowning brow to brow, ourself will hear the accuser and the accused freely speak. I stomach are they both and full of ire, enraged, deaf as the sea, hasty as fire. Many years of happy days before my gracious sovereign, my most loving liege. Each day still better others' happiness, until the heavens, envying earth's good hap, add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both, yet one but flatters us, as well appeared it by the cause you come, namely, to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, heaven be the record to my speech. In the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee, and mark my greeting well. For what I speak, my body shall make good upon this earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live. Since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seem the clouds that in it fly. Once more, the more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat. And wish, so please my sovereign, ere I move, what my tongue speaks, my right-drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. Tis not the trial of a woman's war, the bitter clamor of two eager tongues, can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot that must be cooled for this. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast as to be hushed, and not at all to say. First, the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from giving reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would post until it had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat. Setting aside his high blood's royalty, and let him be no kinsman to my liege, I do defy him, and I spit at him. Call him a slanderous coward and a villain, which to maintain, I would allow him arts and meet him were I tied to run afoot, even to the frozen ridges of the Alps, or any other ground inhabitable wherever Englishman durst set his foot. Meantime, let this defend my loyalty. By all my hopes, most falsely doth he lie. Pale, trembling coward! There I throw my gauge, disclaiming here the kindred of the king, and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear not reverence makes thee to accept. If guilty dread have left thee so much strength as to take up mine honour's pawn, then stoop. By that, and all the rights of knighthood else, will I make good against thee arm to arm what I have spoken, or thou canst worse devise. I take it up, and by that sword I swear, which gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder. I'll answer thee in any fair degree your chivalrous design of knightly trial. And when I mount, alive may I not light, if I be traitor or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us so much as of a thought of ill in it. Look, what I said, my life shall prove it true. That Mowbray hath received eight thousand nobles in name of lendings for your highness soldiers the which he hath detained for lewd employments like a false traitor and injurious villain. Besides, I say, and will in battle prove, or here or elsewhere, to the furthest verge that ever was surveyed by English eye, that all the treasons for these eighteen years, complotted and contrived in this land, fetch from false Mowbray their first head and spring. Further, I say, and further will maintain upon his bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death Suggest his soon believing adversaries, and consequently, like a traitor coward, sluiced out his innocent soul through streams of blood, which blood, like sacrificing Abel's, cries even from the tongueless caverns of the earth to me for justice and rough chastisement. 
and by the glorious worth of my descent, this arm shall do it, or this life be spent. How high a pitch his resolution soars. Thomas of Norfolk, what says thou to this? Oh, my sovereign, turn away his face, and bid his ears a little while be deaf, till I have told this slander of his blood, how God and good men hate so foul a liar. Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, my kingdom's heir, as he is but my father's brother's son. Now by my scepter's awe I make a vow, such neighbor nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him, nor partialize the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray, so art thou. Free speech and fearless I to thee allow. Then, Bolingbroke, as low as to thy heart, through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Callis, disbursed I duly to his highness' soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent, for that my sovereign liege was in my debt upon remainder of a dear account, since last I went to France to fetch his queen. Now, swallow down that lie. Augusta's death, I slew him not, but to mine own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honorable father to my foe, once did I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament, I did confess it, and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest appealed, it issues from the rancor of a villain, a recreant and most degenerate traitor which in myself I boldly will defend and interchangeably hold on my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot to prove myself a loyal gentleman even in the best blood chambered in his bosom. In haste will off, most heartily I pray your highness to assign our trial day. Wrath kindled, gentlemen, be ruled by me. Let's purge this collar without letting blood. This be prescribed, though no physician. Deep malice makes too deep and serious. Forget Forgive, conclude, and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it began. We'll calm the Duke of Norfolk, you your son. To be a makepeace shall become my age. Throw down my son the Duke of Norfolk's gauge. And Norfolk, throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid, there is no boot. So I throw a dread sovereign under thy foot. My life thou shalt command, but not my shame. For one my duty owes, but my fair name, despite of death that lives upon my grave to dark dishonor's use, thou shalt not have. I am disgraced, impeached, and baffled here, pierced to the soul with slander's venomed spear, for which no barn can cure but his hot blood which breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gage. My dear, dear lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That way, men are but gilded loam or painted clay. A jewel in a ten times barred up chest is a bold spirit of a loyal rest. Mine honor is my life. Both grow in one. Take honor from me, and my life is done. Dear my liege, my honor let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw up your gauge, do you begin? Oh, God, defend my soul from such deep sin. Shall I seem crestfallen in my father's sight, or with pale beggar fear impeach my height before this out there dastard? Ere my tongue shall wound my honor with such feeble wrong or sound so base a pall, my teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear and spit it bleeding in his high disgrace where shame doth harbor even in Mowbray's face. We were not born to sue but to command. Which since we cannot do to make you friend. Be ready as your lives shall answer it at Coventry upon St. Lambert's day. There shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate. Since we cannot atone you we shall see justice design the victor's chivalry. Lord Marshal, command our officers at arms, be ready to direct 
he's home alone. in Gloucester's blood doth more solicit me than your exclaims to stir against the butchers of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault that we cannot correct, put we our quarrel to the will of heaven, who when they see the hours ripe on earth will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Finds brotherhood in thee no sharper spur? Hath love in thy old blood no living fire? Edward's seven sons, Whereof thyself art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those seven are dried by nature's course, some of those branches by the destined cut. But Thomas, my dear Lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root is cracked, and all the precious liquor spilt is hacked down, and his summer leaves all faded by envy's hand and murder's bloody axe. Ah, gaunt, his blood was thine, that bed, that womb, that metal, that self-mould, that passion thee, made him a man. And though thou livest and breathest, yet art thou slain in him. Thou dost consent in some large measure to thy father's death, in that thou seest thy wretched brother die who was the model of thy father's life. Call it not patience, Gaunt, it is despair. In suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou showest the naked pathway to thy life, teaching stern murder how to butcher thee. That which in mean men we entitle patience is pale cold cowardice in noble breasts. What shall I say, to safeguard thine own life, the best way is to avenge my Gloucester's death. God's is the quarrel, for God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight, hath caused his death. The which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge, for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where then, alas, may I complain myself? You go. The widow's champion. Why, then, I will. Farewell, old God. Thou goes to Coventry, there to behold our cousin Hereford and tell Mowbray fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrongs on Hereford's fear, that it may enter butcher Mowbray's breast. Or if misfortune miss the first career, be Mowbray's sin so heavy in his bosom, that they may break his foaming courses back and throw the rider headlong in the lists, a caitiff recreant to my cousin Hereford. Farewell, old Gaunt, thy sometimes brother's wife. With her companion, grief must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. Yet one word more. Grief boundeth where it falls, not with the empty hollowness, but wait. I take my leave before I have begun. For sorrow ends not when it seemeth done. Commend me to thy brother, Edmund York. Lo, this is all. Stay, yet depart not so. Though this be all, do not so quickly go. I shall remember more. Bid him, oh, what? With all good speed, a flashy visit me. Alack, and what shall good old York there see but empty lodgings, and unfurnished walls, unpeopled offices, untrodden stones, and what here there for welcome but my groans? Therefore, commend me. Let him not come there to seek out sorrow that dwells everywhere. Desolate, desolate will I hence and die. The last leave of thee takes my weeping eye. points and longs to enter in. The Duke of Norfolk, spritefully and bold, stays but the summons of the appellant's trumpet. By then the champions are prepared and stay for nothing but his majesty's approach.
Marshal, demand of yonder champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. Ask him his name, and orderly proceed to swear him in the justice of his cause. In God's name and the King's, say who thou art, and why thou comest thus knightly clad in arms. Against what man thou comest, and what thy quarrel. Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath, as so defend thee heaven and thy valour. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither come engaged by my oath. God defend a knight should violate. Both defend my loyalty and truth, God, my king, and my succeeding in truth, against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me. By the grace of God and this mine arm, to prove him in defending of myself, a traitor to my God, my king, and me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. <laughs> Marshal, ask yonder knight in arms both who he is and why he cometh hither thus stated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name, and wherefore comest thou hither before King Richard in his royal list? Against whom comest thou, and what's thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, so defend thee heaven. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby am I. Already here do stand in arms to prove, by God's grace and my body's valour, enlists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he's a traitor, foul and dangerous to God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the lists, except the marshal and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knee before his majesty. For Mowbray and myself are like two men that bow a long and weary pilgrimage. And let us take a ceremonious leave and loving farewell of our several friends. The appellant in all duty greets your highness and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood. Which if today thou shed, lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. Oh, let no noble eye profane a tear for me, if I be God with Mowbray's spear. As confident as is a falcon's flight against a bird, do I with Mowbray fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you. Of you, my noble cousin, Lord Amurl. Not sick, although I have to do with death, but lusty, young, and cheerly drawing breath. Lo, as at English feasts, so I regret the daintiest last. Make the end most sweet. O thou, the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate, doth with a twofold vigor lift me up to reach at victory above my head. Add proof unto mine armor with thy prayers, and with thy blessings steal my lance's point, that it may enter Mowbray's waxen coat, and furbish new the name of John Agaunt, even in the lusty behavior of his son. God, in thy good cause, make thee prosperous. Be swift like lightning in the execution, and let thy blows, doubly redoubled, fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse pernicious enemy. Rouse up thy youthful blood, be valiant, and live mine innocency in St. George to thrive. However God or fortune cast by lot, there lives or dies, true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage, and embrace his golden, uncontrolled entrenchment more than my dancing soul that celebrate this feast of battle with my adversary. Most mighty British, and my companion peers, take from my mouth the wish of happy years, as gentle and as jocund as to jest go I to fight. Truth hath a quiet rest. Farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valor couching. Order the trial, marshal, and begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, receive thy lance, and God defend thy right. Strong as a tower in hope, I cry, Amen. Go bear this lance to Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby stands here for God, his sovereign, and himself on pain to be found false and recreant to prove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, a traitor to his God, his King, and him, and dares him to set forward to the fight. Yes, standeth Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, 
on pain to be found false and recreant, both to defend himself and to approve Henry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, to guard his sovereign and to him disloyal, courageously and with a free desire, attending but the signal to begin. Sound trumpets! <laughs> And set forward, combatants. Stay! The king hath thrown his warder down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spears and both return back to their chairs again. Withdraw with us. And let the trumpet sound while we return these dukes what we decree. <laughs> what with our council we have done. For that our kingdom's earth could not be soiled with that dear blood of apostolate, for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds bowed up with neighbor's soul. For we think the eagle-winged pride, sky aspiring and ambitious thoughts with rival hating envy set on you to wake our peace which in our country's cradle draws the sweet infant breath of gentle sleep, which so roused up with boisterous untuned drums, with harsh resounding trumpets dreadful bray, and grating shock of wrathful iron arms, might from our quiet confines bright their peace, and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore, we banish you our territories. You, cousin Hereford upon pain of death, Till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regret our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be. That sun that warms you here shall shine on me, and those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. More hurtfully remains a heavier doom which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. Hope this word of never to return and do thy against thee in the name of life. It is sentence, my most sovereign nature. All I will look for from your highness, Margaret. My dear merit, not so deep a maid, must to be cast forth in the common air have I deserved it at your highness' hands. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English, now I must forego. Now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed vial, or a harp, or like a cunning instrument, cased up, or being open, put into his hands that knows no touch to tune the harmony. Within my mouth you have enjailed my tongue, doubly portcullis with my teeth and lips, and dull, unfeeling, barren ignorance has made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to perform a paradise, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence then but speechless death that robs my tongue from breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate after our sentence Planing comes too late. Then, thus I turn me from my country's light to dwell in solemn shades of envy. Return again and take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Where, by the duty that you owe to God, our path therein we banish with yourselves to keep the oath that we administer, you never shall, so help you truth and God, Embrace each other's love in banishment, nor ever look upon each other's face, nor never write regret, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your homebred hate, nor never by advised purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear, and I to keep all this, nor look so far as to my enemy, by this time, had the king permitted us, one of our souls had wandered in the air, banished this frail sepulchre of our flesh, 
as now our flesh is banished from this land. Confess thy treasons ere thou fly this realm. Since thou hast far to go, bear not along the clogging burthen of a guilty soul. No, boiling rock. If ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know. And all too soon I hear the king shall rule. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray. Hey, back to England. All the world's my way. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect, that from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters spent, return with welcome home from banishment. How long a time lies in one little word. Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I thank my liege that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile. But little vantage shall I reap thereby. For ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about, my oil-dried lamp and time be wasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burnt and done, and blindfold death not let me see, my son. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Shorten my days thou canst with sullen sorrow and pluck nights from me, but not lend a morrow. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, but stop no wrinkle in his pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death, but dead thy kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good advice, whereto thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why had our justice seems by then to laugh? Things sweet to taste prove indigestion, sir. You urged me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger, not my child, to smooth his fault, I should have been more mild. A partial slander sought I to avoid, and in the sentence, my own life destroyed. Alas, I looked when some of you should say I was too strict to make mine own away. But you gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell. An uncle bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. <laughs> Cousin, farewell. What presents must not know from where you do remain, let paper show. My lord, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land will let me by your side. Oh, to what purpose dost thou hold thy words that thou returnst no greeting to thy friends? I have too few to take my leave of you. When the tongue's office should be prodigal to breathe the abundant dollar of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence for a time. Joy absent, grief is present for that time. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. To men in joy, but grief makes one hour ten. Call it a travel that thou takes for pleasure. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. The sullen passage of thy weary steps esteem as foil, wherein thou art to set the precious jewel of thy home return. Nay. Rather, every tedious stride I make will but remember me what a deal of world I wander from the jewels that I love. Must I not serve a long apprenticehood to foreign passages, and in the end, having my freedom, boast of nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief? All places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Woe doth the heavier sit where it perceives it is but faintly born. Go, say I sent thee forth to purchase honor, and not the king exiled thee. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air, and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look what thy soul holds dear. Imagine it to lie that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing bird's musician. The grass whereon thou treads the present strewed, the flowers, fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or a dance. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it and sets it light. Oh, 
Who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty Caucasus? Or cloy the hungry edge of appetite by bare imagination of a feast? Or wallow naked in December snow by thinking on fantastic summer's heat? Oh, no! The apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. Fell sorrow's tooth doth never rankle more than when he bites but lanceth not the sore. Come, come, my son. I'll bring thee on thy way. And I, thy youth and cause, I would not stay. Then England's ground farewell. Sweet soil adieu. My mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, boast of this I can, though banished. Yet a true-born Englishman. <laughs> we did observe. <laughs> Cousin O'Merl, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. And say, what store of parting tears were shed? Faith, none for me, except the northeast wind, which then blew bitterly against our face, awaked the sleepy room, and so, by chance, did grace our hollow party with a tear. What said our cousin when you parted from him? Farewell. And for my heart is dainted that my tongue should so profane the word, that taught me craft, the counterfeit, oppression, of such grief that words seem buried in my sorrow's grave. Now they would the word farewell have lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment. He should have had a volume of farewells. But since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. But tis doubt when time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsmen come to see his friend. Ourself and Bushy, Baggett here and Green, observed his courtship to the common people, how he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy, what reverence he did throw away on slaves, wooing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles and patient underbearing of his fortune, as twere to banish their effects with him. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench. A brace of draymen did God speed him well, and had the tribute of his supple knee. With thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends. Oh, I swear our England in reversion is, and he our subjects next degree in hope. Well, he is gone. With him go these thoughts. Now for the rebel which stand out in Ireland. Expedient manage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them further means, for their advantage in your highness lost. We will ourselves in person to this war. Before our coffers, with too great a court and liberal largesse, have grown somewhat light, we are enforced to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that comes short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, where too, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after to supply our wants. For we will make for Ireland presently. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord, suddenly taken, and hath sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Where lies he? At Ely House. Now put it, God, in the physician's mind to help him to his grave immediately. <laughs> the lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray, God, we may make haste and come too late. Amen. <laughs> Will the king come, that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstained youth? Vex not yourself. Nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught to close. More are men's ends, Mark, than their lives. 
the setting sun and music at the close as the last taste of sweets is sweetest last writ in remembrance more than things long past though Richard my life's counsel would not hear my death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear no it is stopped with other flattering sounds as praises of his state then there are found lascivious meters whose venom sound the open ear of youth hath always listened. Report of fashion in proud Italy, whose manners still our tardy, apish nation limps after in base imitation. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity, so it be new, there's no respect how vile, that is not quickly buzzed into his ears? Then all too late comes counsel to be heard, where will doth mutiny with wit's regard, direct not him whose way himself will choose. His breath thou lackst, and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. He tires betimes that spurs too fast betimes. With eager feeding, food doth choke the feeder. Light vanity and passionate cormorant, consuming means soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, the seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection in the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed flock, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home, for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre and stubborn jury of the world's ransom. Blessed Mary's son, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it like to a tenement or pelting farm. England bound in with a triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune is now bound in with shame with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds, that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Oh, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. The king is come, deal mildly with his youth, for young hot colts being raged to rage the more. How fares our noble uncle Lancaster? What comfort, man? How is to the aged Gaunt? Oh, how that name befits my composition. Old Gaunt indeed, and Gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not Gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched, watching breeds leanness, leanness is all Gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean my children's look. And therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave. Gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits not the bone. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No. Misery makes sport to mock itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No, no. Men living flatter those that die. 
Thou, now a dying, says thou flatterest me. Oh, no. Thou diest, though I the sick of thee. I am in health. I breathe and see thee ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill. Ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick. And thou, too careless patient as thou art, commits thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his son, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease. But for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law, and thou... A lunatic, uh, lean-witted fool, presuming on an ague's privilege, darest with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now by my seat's right royal majesty, wert thou not brother to great Edward's son, this tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, hast thou tapped out and drunken leaker out. My brother Gloucester, plain, well-meaning soul, whom fair befall in heaven amongst happy souls, may be a precedent and witness good that thou respects not spilling Edward's blood. Join with the present sickness that I am, and thy unkindness be like crooked age to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be. Convey me to my bed, then to my bed. Thou failed to live that love And let them die of age of some have. For both hast thou, and both become the grave. I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life, and holds you dear, as Harry, Duke of Hereford, were he here. Right, you say true. As Hereford's love, so his, as theirs, so mine. And all be as it is. My liege, old Gaunt commends him to your majesty. What says he? Nay, nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life, and all hold Lancaster. Be York the next, that must be bankrupt so, though death be poor, it ends a mortal world. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be. So much for that. Now, for our Irish walls. We must supplant these rough, rug-headed kerns which live like venom where no venom else but only they have privilege to live. And for these great affairs do ask some charge. Towards our assistance we do seize to us the plate, coin, revenues and movables whereof our Uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. Oh. Oh. Long shall I be patient. Oh, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, nor Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace has ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion raged more fierce, in peace was never gentle lamb more mild than was that young and princely gentleman. 
His face thou hast. For even so looked he, accomplished with a number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French, and not against his friends. His noble hand did win what he did spend, and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. Oh, Richard, York is too far gone with grief, or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? Oh, my liege, pardon me if you please. If not, I, I please not to be pardoned, and I am content with all. Seek you to seize and gripe into your hands the royalties and rights of banished heritage. He is not gaunt dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not gaunt just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away, and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king, but by fair sequence and succession? Now, for God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, call in the letters patents that he hath by his attorneys general to sue his livery, and deny his offered homage. You pluck a thousand dangers on your head. You lose a thousand well-disposed hearts. And prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honor and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his land. I'll not be by the while. My liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof, there's none can tell. By bad courses may be understood that their events can never for our good. Go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire Straits. Bid him repair to us at Ely House to see this business. Tomorrow next we will for Ireland, and tis time I trow. And we create, in absence of ourself, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England, for he is just and always loved us well. Come on, our queen. Tomorrow must be far. Be merry for our time of stay. Sure. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living, too, for now his son is due. Fairly entitled, not in revenue. Richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great, but it must break with silence ere it be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, hey, speak thy mind. Let him ne'er speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Hence that thou speak to the Duke of Hereford. If it be so, out with it boldly, man. Quick is mine ear to hear of good towards him. No good at all that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now, for God, to shame, such wrongs are born in him, a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers. And what they will inform merely in hate against any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute. Against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons have he filled with grievous taxes and quite lost their hearts. The nobles have he fined for ancient quarrels and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised as blanks, benevolences, and I wot not what. What in God's name doth become of this? Wars have not wasted it, for war he hath not but basely yielded upon compromise that which his ancestors achieved with blows. More as he spent in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king's grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hang it over here. He hath not money for these Irish wars. His burdenous taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king. But, Lord, we hear this fearful tempest yet seek no help to avoid the storm. We see the wind sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but securely perish. You see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our wreck. Not so, even through the hollow eyes of death. I cannot say. Nay, let us share thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyself, and speaking so thy words are but as thoughts. Therefore, be bold. Then, thus, I have from Fort Leblanc, a bay in Brittany, 
received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold, Lord Cobham, had laid broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother Archbishop, late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir John Rampston, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton and Francis Point, all these well furnished by the Duke of Bretagne, with eight tall ships, 3,000 men of war, are making hither with all due expedience, and shortly mean to cut apart more than draw. Perhaps they had ere this, but that they stay the first departing of the King for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, impart our drooping country, broken wound, redeem from broken corn the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself. Away with me and post the raven. But if you faint, as fearing to do so, stay and be sick. And myself will go. To horse, to horse! Search doubts for them that fear. Hold out my horse and I will first be there. Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside self-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king I did. To please myself I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief. Save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, I think some unborn sorrow, ripe in fortune's womb, is coming towards me. And my inward soul with nothing trembles, but something it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye, glazed with blinding tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives, which rightly gazed upon show nothing but confusion, eyed or eye, distinguish form. So your sweet majesty, looking awry upon your lord's departure, finds shapes of grief more than himself to wail, which, looked on as it is, is naught but shadows of what it is not. Then thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure, weep not, more's not seen. Or if it be, tis with false sorrow's eye, which for things true weeps things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. Howe'er it be, I cannot but be sad, so heavy sad, as though on thinking on no thought I think, makes me with heavy nothing faint and shrink. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady. Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so, for nothing hath begot my something grief, or something hath the nothing that I grieve. Tis in reversion that I do possess, but what it is, it is not yet known, what I cannot name. With nameless woe, I wot. God save your majesty, and well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why hopest thou so? Tis better hope he is, for his designs crave haste, his haste good hope. Then wherefore dost thou hope he is not shipped? That he, our hope, might have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope, who strongly hath set footing in this land. The banished Bolingbroke repeals himself, and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravensburg. Thou God in heaven forbid! Oh, madam, tis too true. That is worse, the Lord Northumberland, his son young Henry Percy, the lords of Ross, Beaumont and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have. Whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So, we, thou art the midwife to my woe. And Bolingbroke, my sorrow's dismal heir. Now hath my soul brought forth her prodigy, and I, a gasping new delivered mother, have woe to woe, sorrow to sorrow joined. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair, and be at enmity with cousining hope. He is a flatterer, a parasite, a keeper back of death, who gently would dissolve the bands of life, which false hope lingers in extremity. Here comes the Duke of York with signs of war about his aged neck. Oh, the careful business of his looks. Uncle, for God's sake, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts.
comforts in heaven and we are on the earth where nothing lives but crosses, care and grief. Your husband, he is gone to save far off whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I left to underprop his lamb, who, weak with age, cannot support myself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. My lord, hmm? your son was gone before I came. He was? Why so? Go all which way it will. Nobles, they are fled. The commons, they are cold. And will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. And said, I get thee to Plashy, to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pounds. Uh, hold, take my ring. My lord, I, I had hmm. forgot to tell your lordship. Today I came by and called there. But I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is knave? An hour before I came, the Duchess died. God, for his mercy, what a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land. I know not what to do. I would to God, so my untruth had not provoked him to it. The king had cut off my head with my brothers. What? Are there no posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister. Cousin, I would say. Pray pardon me. Uh, go, fellow. Get thee home. Provide some carts and bring away the armor that is there. Gentlemen, will you go muster men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs, thus thrust disorderly into my hands, never but. Both are my kinsmen. The one is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. The other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men, and meet me presently at Barclay Castle. I should to catch it too, but time will not permit. All is uneven, and everything is left the wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. And that's the wavering commons. For their love lies in their purses. And whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, then so do we. Because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Neither will I with you. A little office will the hateful commons perform for us, except like churs to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No, I will to Ireland, to His Majesty. Farewell. If heart's presages be not vain, we three here part, but ne'er shall meet again. That's as York tries to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Duke, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once, for once, for all and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me, never. How far is it, my lord, to Barclay Wall? Believe me, noble lord, I am a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high wild hills and rough uneven ways draw out our miles and make them wearisome. And yet our fair discourse has been a sugar, making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me, what a weary way from Ravensburg to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Willoughby, wanting your company, which I protest has very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel. But theirs is sweetened with the hope to have the present benefit which I possess, and hope for joy that will less enjoy than hope enjoy. By this, the weary lords shall make their way seem short, as mine has done, by sight of what I have, your noble company. Of much less value is my company than your good words. But who comes here? It is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Worcester, whensoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? Well, I had thought, my lord, to have learned his help of you. Why, is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court broken his staff of office and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spake together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. Oh, yes. But he, my lord, 
suppose he's gone to Ravensburg to offer service to the Duke of Hereford and sent me over by Barclay to discover what power the Duke of York had levied there. Then with directions to repair to Ravensburg. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? Oh, my good lord, but that is not forgot which there I did remember. To my knowledge, I never in my life did look at him. And learn to know him now. Gracious Lord, I tender you my service, such as it is, being tender, raw, and young, which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more approved service and deserve. I thank thee, gentle Percy, and be sure I count myself in nothing else so happy as in a soul remembering my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, my hand thus seals. How far is it to Barclay? And what spur gives good old York there with his men of war? There stands the castle by on top of the tree, and with three hundred men, as I have heard, and in it are the lords of York, Barclay, and Seymour, none else of name and noble letters. Here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spur, fiery red with hate. Welcome, my lords. I watch your love pursues a banished traitor. All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enriched shall be your love and labor's recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. And far surmounts our labor to attain it. Evermore, thanks. The exchequer of the poor, which till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my party. And who comes here? It is my lord of Bath. My lord of Hereford, my message is to you. My lord, my answer is to Lancaster. And I am come to seek that name in England. And I must find that title in your tongue before I make reply to what you say. mistake me not, my lord. It is not my meaning to raise one title of your honor. To you, my lord, I come, but more than simple, from the most gracious region of this land, the Duke of York, to know what fits you on to take advantage of the absent time and fright our native feats with self-born arms. I shall not need transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person. A noble. Show me thy humble heart, not thy knee. You be deceivable and false. My gracious uncle. Tut, tut, grace me no grace. For unto me, I am no traitor, as uncle. That word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? And then more why? Why have they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom, fighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms? Come thou, because the anointed king is hence. Why, foolish boy, a king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it and where is it? Even in condition of the worst degree. In gross rebellion and detested treason. Thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. My father, for let me I see and form. For then, my father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned, a wandering vagabond, by rights and royalties, plucked from my arms perforce and given away to upstart unthrifts? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king of England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, for Merle, my noble cousin. Had you first died and he been thus trod down, he should have found his uncle born. The round of the the pain. I am denied to sue my livery, and yet my letters, patents, give me leave. My father's goods are all restrained and sold, and these and all are all amiss employed. What would you have me do? I am a subject, and 
that I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me, and therefore, personally, I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke has been too much abused. And shall grace upon to do him right. Face men, by his endowments, are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feelings with my cousin's daughter. Labored all I could to do him right. But in this country, to come in braving arms, be his own card, and cut out his way, find out right with wrong, it may not be. And you the two have met him in this kind? Cherish rebellion. And our rebels all. Oh. The noble duke has sworn his coming is but for his own. And for the right of that, we all are strongly sworn to give him aid. And let him ne'er see George the prince. <laughs> My Lord of Salisbury, we have stayed ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thought the king is dead. We will not stay. Bay trees in our country are all withered, and meteors fright the fixed stars of heaven. Pale-faced moon looks bloody on the earth. And lean looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad and ruffians dance and leap. The one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by rage and war. These signs forerun the death or fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled. As well assured, Richard their king is dead. Ah, Richard. With the eyes of heavy mind, I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come, woe and unrest. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. <laughs> forth these men. For she and Green, I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies, with too much urging your pernicious lives, but were no charity. Yet to wash your blood from off my hands, here in the view of men, I will unfold some causes of your death. You have misled a prince, a royal king, Happy gentlemen in blood and lineaments, by you unhappy and disfigured king. You have in manner with your sinful hours made a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broke the possession of a royal bed and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears drawn from her eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself a prince, by fortune of my birth, near to the king in blood and near in love, till you did make him misinterpret me have stooped my neck under your injuries and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds eating the bitter bread of banishment. Whilst you have fed upon my seigneuries, disparked my parks and felled my forest woods, from my own windows torn my household coat, raised out my impress, leaving me no sign save men's opinions and my living blood to show the world I am a gentleman. This and much more much more than twice all this condemns you to the death. See them delivered over to execution and the hand of death. More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lords, farewell! My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. Uncle, you say the queen is at your house. For God's sake, fairly let her be in peace. Tell her I send to her my kind command. Take special care, my greeting people. Gentlemen of mine, I have dispatched with letters of your love. Thanks, gentlemen. Come, lords, away to fight with Glendower and his compasses. A while to work, and after holiday. Hey, my lord, how brooks your grace the air after your late tossing? 
indeed must I like it well. I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand. The rebels wound thee with her horses. As a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting, so weeping, smiling, meet I thee, my earth, and do thee favors with my royal hand. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweets comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated toads lie in their way, doing annoyance to the treacherous feet which with usurping steps do trample thee. Yield stinging nettles to mine enemies, and when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder, whose double tongue may, with a mortal touch, throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. Mock not my senseless conjuration, Lord. This earth shall have a feeling, and these stones prove armed soldiers there, and native king shall falter under foul rebellion there. Fear oh. not, my lord. The power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. That means that heaven yields must be embraced and not neglected. Else, if heaven would, and we will not, heaven's offer we refuse. The proper means of succor and redress. He means, my lord, that we are too remiss whilst Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in power. This comfortable cousin, knowest thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe and lights the lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murder and in outrage boldly here. When from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his light to every guilty hole, then treasons, murders, and detested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. So when this thief, this traitor Bolingbroke, who all this while hath reveled in the night whilst we were wandering over the antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne the east. His treason shall sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrighted, tremble at his sin. Not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from the mighty king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the man. For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the rights. Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? Nor near, nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. This comfort guides my tongue and bids me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear me, noble lord, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. Oh, call back yesterday, bid time return, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. Today, today, unhappy day, too late, or throws thy joys, friends, fortune, and thy faith. For all the Welshmen, hearing thou wert dead, art gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort, my liege. Why looks your grace so pale? But now the blood of twenty thousand men did triumph in my face, and they are fled. Till so much blood did there come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that would be safe fly from my side, or time set the blot upon my crime. Comfort, my liege, remember who you are. I have forgot myself, am I not king? Awake, thou coward majesty, thou sleepst. Is not the king's name twenty thousand names? Arm, arm, my name, a puny subject strikes of thy great glory. Look not to the ground, ye favorites of the king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know our uncle York had power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? More health and happiness betide my liege than can my care to and tongue deliver him. My ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. What is my kingdom lost? Why, it was my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Besides Bolingbroke to be as great as we, greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too, and be his fellow so. Revolt our subjects that we cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as us. Thy ruin, woe, destruction, loss, decay. The worst is death. 
And death will have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity. Like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores as if the world were all dissolved to tears. So high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land with hard, bright steel and hearts harder than steel. White beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty. Boys with women's voices strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff, unwieldy arms against thy crown. Thy very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal you against thy state. Yea, distaff women manage rusty bills against thy seat. Both young and old rebel, and all goes worse than I have power to tell. Too well, too well, thou dost offense. Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Bagot? What is become of bushes? Where is green that they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps? If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I warrant they have made peace with Bolingbroke. Peace have they made with him indeed. Oh, villains, vipers, damned without redemption. Dogs easily want to fawn on any man. Snakes in my heart, blood warm, that sting my heart. Judas is each one twice worse than Judas. Would they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted souls for this offense. Sweet love, I see, changing his property turns to the sourest and most deadly thing. Again, uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death destroying wounds and lie full low grave in the hollow ground. Bushy, Green, and the Earl of Wiltshire there? Aye. All of them at Bristol lost their heads. Where is the Duke, my father, with his power? No matter where. Of comfort, no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of will. And yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our bolling books. Nothing can we call our own save death. And that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown around mortal temples of a king keeps death his corpse. There the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize the fear of killed moose, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humoured thus, comes at the last, and with a little pin, bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king. Cover your head, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn revel. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friend. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, 
My lord, wise men now sit and wail their woes, but presently prevent the ways to wait. To fear the foe, since fear oppresseth strength, gives in your weakness strength unto your foe, and so your follies fight against yourself. Fear and be slain, but the worst can come to fight. And fight and die is death-destroying death, where fearing dying pays death servile breath. My father hath a power to inquire of him and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chides me well, proud folly, for I come to change blows with thee for this day of doom. This ague fit of fear is overblown. An easy task it is to win our own. Say, Scroop, where lies our uncle with his power? Speak sweetly, man, although thy looks be sour. Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state and inclination of the day. So may you, by my dull and heavy eye, my tongue have but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer by small and small to lengthen out the worst that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his part. Thou hast said enough. Sweet way I was in to despair. What say you now? What comfort have we now? I heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly that bids me be of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle. There I'll pine away. A king woe slave till kingly woe obey. The power I have discharged. And let them go to ear the land that hath some hope to grow. For I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this, for counsel is but vain. I leave one word. He does me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers. Let them hence away from Richard's night. Volume. So that by this intelligence we learn the Welshmen are dispersed, and Salisbury has gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hid his head. It would be seen the Lord Northumberland to say King Richard. Lack the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes, only to be brief, left I his title out. The time hath been. Would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, farther than you should. Take not, good cousin, farther than you should. Lest you mistake the heavens or all your head. I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. But who comes here? Welcome, Harry. What, will not this castle yield? The castle royally is man, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Why, it contains no king. Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon lime and stone, and with him the Lord O'Mare, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroope, besides a clergyman of holy reverence, who I cannot learn. Oh, belike it is the Bishop of Carlisle. Noble Lord, go to the rude lips of that ancient castle, and brazen trumpet send the breath of power into his ruined ears, and thus deliver Henry Bonnemore upon his knees. And sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his royal person. Hither come even at his feet to lay my arms in power. Provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood rain from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen, the which how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is, such crimson tempest should be drenched the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land. My stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go 
signify it. While here we march on the grassy carpet of this plain. Let's march without the noise of threatening drum. But from this castle's tepid battlements, our fair appointment may be welcome. I think in which you and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water. When their thundering smoke at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. Be he the fire, I'll be the yielding water. The rage be his whilst on the earth I rain my waters. On the earth, and not on him. March on, and mark King Richard. Richard doth himself appear. Is that the blushing, discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east, when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory, and to stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident? Head looks he like a king. Behold his eye, as bright as is the eagle's, lightens forth controlling majesty. Alack. Alack. That any harm stays. We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king, and if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship, for well we know. No hand of blood and bone can drag the sacred handle of our scepter, but that you profane, steal, or use us. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet know my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in the clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children, yet unborn and unbegot, that lift your vassal hand against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bolingbroke, for yon meetings he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He has come to ope the purple testament of bleeding war, but ere the crown he look for dwell in peace, ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face. Turn the complexion of her maid pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pastures grass with faithful English blood. The King of Heaven forbid our Lord the King should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth humbly kiss thy hand and by the honourable tomb he swears that stands upon your royal grandsire's bone and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunt, and by the worth and honour of himself comprising all that may be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal party granted once, his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince, is just, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland, say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number to spare him on to be accomplished without contradiction. And all the gracious utterance Speak to his gentle hearing, I will promise. Shall we go back to Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor and so die? Oh, good man. That fight of gentle words, your kind lend friends, and friends their helpful sword. Oh, God! Oh, God! There, this tongue of mine that made the sentence of dread vanish. Foul man, take it off again with words of soup. 
all that I were as great as it might be, or lesser than my name, all that I could forget what I had been, or not remember what I was. Well, thou proud heart, I'll give thee scope to beat. Suppose have scope to beat both thee and me. Well, come to them, come back to the point. What does the king do now? He submits. The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be content. Must he lose the name of king? God's name. Let it go. I will give my jewels to the set of kings. Or the palace of the king. The day of travel for arms has been down. The figure of the Subject to the fair of Tarvid Singh and my large kingdom. For it is a great, a lifting, a feeling, a spirit of the king. Or I'll be buried in the king's highway, somewhere of coming trade. Subject to feet may hourly trample on their sovereign head. For on my heart they tread whilst now I live and buried once, why not upon my head? Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a lake, Bolingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Oh, ah, oh, I come. Thy glistering faith and wanting the manage of unruly jades in the base court. Base court where kings grow base to come at traitor's call and do them grave. In the base court, come down. Down court, down king. For night owl sheep where mounting last. What says his majesty? Sorrow and grief of heart make him speak fondly like a frantic man. Yet he is come. Stand all apart, and so fair it is. My gracious Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee, make the base earth proud with kissing it. He rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your curtain. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know, thus high at least, although your need. My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and more. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as my true service shall deserve your life. Well you deserve, they well deserve to have that know the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hand. Nay, why? Tears show their love, but want their remedy. Cousin, I am too young to be your father. You are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to. As do we must, not force. Head on towards London. Cousin, is it so? Yea. Then I must not sleep. No. 
here in this garden to drive away the heavy thought of care. Madam, we'll pay it both. It will make me think the world is full of rubs and that my fortune runs against the bias. Madam, we'll dance. My legs can keep no measure in delight and my poor heart no measure keeps in grief. Therefore, no dancing, girl, some other sport. Madam, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow or of joy. Of either, madam. Of neither, girl. For if of joy being altogether wanting, it doth remember me the more of sorrow. Or if of grief, being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy. For what I have, I need not to repeat. And what I want, it boots not to complain. Madam, I'll sing. Tis well that thou hast cause. But thou shouldst please me better, wouldst thou weep? I could weep, madam. Would it do you good? And I could sing, would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear of thee. But stay. Here come the gardeners. Let's step into the shadow of these trees. My wretchedness unto a row of pins, they'll talk of state. But every one doth so against a change. Woe is forerun with woe. Go! Find thou up yon dangling apricots, which like unruly children make their sires stoop with oppression of their prodigal weight. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, and like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays that look too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government. You thus employed, we will go root away the noisome weeds which without profit suck the soil's fertility from wholesome flowers. Why should we, in the compass of a tale, keep law and form and due proportion, showing as in a model our firm estate, when our sea walled garden, the whole land is full of weeds, the fairest flowers choked up, her fruit trees all unpruned, her edges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with Hold thy peace. He that hath suffered this disordered spring hath now himself met with the fall of leaf. The weeds which his broad spreading leaves did shelter, that seemed in eating him to hold him up, are plucked up root and all by Bolingbroke. I mean the Earl of Wiltshire, Bushy. Green. What are they, they are, and Bolingbroke hath seized the wasteful king. Ah, oh, what pity is it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. We, at time of year, do wound the bark, the skin of our fruit trees, lest being overproud in sap and blood, with too much riches it confound itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear and he to taste their fruits of duty. Superfluous branches we lop away, that bearing boughs may live. Had he done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours had quite thrown down. What? Think you then the king shall be deposed? Depressed he is already, and deposed is doubt he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's that tell black tidings. Oh, I am pressed to death for want of speech. Thou, old Adam's likeness, mm -hmm. set to dress this garden. How dare thy harsh, rude tongue sound this unpleasing news? Oh, madam. What he, what serpent has suggested thee to make a second fall of cursed man? Why dost thou say King Richard is deposed? Dare thou! Thou little better thing than earth, divine his downfall. Say where, when, and how camest thou by this ill tidings? Speak the wretch! Pardon me, madam. Little joy have I to breathe these news. Yet what I say is true. King Richard he is in the mighty hold of Bolingbroke. Their fortunes both are weighed. In your lord's scale is nothing but himself and some few vanities that make him light. But in the balance of great Bolingbroke besides himself are all the English peers. And with that odds he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London and you'll find it so. I speak no more than every man that know. Doth not thy embassage belong to me? And am I last that knows? Oh, thou thinkst to serve me last that I may longest keep thy sorrow in my breast. 
Come, ladies, go. To meet at London, London's king in woe. What was I born to this? That my sad look should grace the triumph of great Bolingbroke. Gardener, for telling me this news of woe. Pray God the plants thou grow may never grow. Poor queen. So that thy state might be no worse, I would my skill were subject to thy curse. Here did she fall a tear. Here in this place I'll set a bank of rue, sour herb of grace. Rue, even for Ruth, here shortly shall be seen in the remembrance of her weeping weed. Freely speak thy mind what thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death. Who wrought it with the king, and who performed the bloody office of his timeless end? It set before my face the Lord O'Merle. Cousin, stand forth and look upon that man. My Lord O'Merle, I know your daring tongue scorns to unsay what once it hath delivered. In that dead time when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, is not my arm of length that reacheth from the restful English court as far as Callis to mine uncle's head? Amongst much other talk that very time, I heard you say that you would rather refuse the offer of an hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England. Adding withal, how blessed this land would be in this your cousin's death. Princes and noble lords, what answer shall I make to this base man? Shall I so much dishonor my fair stars on equal terms to give him chastisement? Either I must or have mine honor soiled with the attainder of his slanderous lips. There is my gauge, the manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell. I say thou liest, and will maintain what thou hast said is false in thy heart's blood, though being all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword. Bagot, forbear, thou shalt not take it up. Excepting one, I would he were the best in all this presence that hath moved me so. If that thy valour stand on sympathies, there is my gauge, O Merlin, gauge to thine. By that fair son which shows me where thou standst, I heard thee say, and vauntingly thou spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest it twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart when it was forged with my rapier's point. Thou darest not, coward, live to see that day. No, by my soul, I would it were this hour. It's what thou damned in hell for this. O Mao, thou liest. His honor is as true in this appeal as thou art all unjust, and that thou art so, there I throw my gauge to prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it, if thou dare. And if I do not, may my hands rot off and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmet of my foe. I task the earth to the like, forsworn O'Merle, and spur thee on with full as many lies as may be hollowed in thy treacherous ear from sun to sun. There is my honor's for. Engage it to the trial, if thou dare. Who sets me else? By heaven I'll throw at all. I have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as you. My Lord Fitzwater, I do remember well the very time, O Merlin, you did talk. Tis very true. You were in presence then, and you can witness with me this is true. As false by heaven as heaven itself is true. Sorry, thou liest. Dishonorable boy. That lie shall lie so heavy on my sword that it shall render vengeance and revenge till thou the lie giver and that lie do lie in earth as quiet as thy father's skull. Proof whereof there is my honor's fault. Gage it to the trial if thou darest. How fondly dost thou spur a forward horse. If I dare eat, or drink, or breathe, or live, I dare meet Surrey in a wilderness and spit upon him whilst I say he lies and lies and lies. There is my bond of faith to tie thee to my strong correction. As I intend to thrive in this new world, O Merle is guilty of my true appeal. Besides, I heard the banished Norfolk say that thou, O Merle, didst send two of thy men to execute the noble duke at Calais. Some honest Christian trust me with a gauge that Norfolk lies. Here do I throw down this, if he may be repealed, to try his honor. These differences shall all rest under gate. Till Norfolk be repealed, if you he shall be. And though mine enemy restored again to all his lands and seigneuries, when he's returned against O Merle, we will enforce his pride. That honorable day shall ne'er be seen. 
Many a time have banished Norfolk Fort for Jesus Christ in glorious Christian field, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks, and Saracens, and toiled with works of war, retired himself to it. There at Venice gave his body to that pleasant country's earth, and his pure soul unto his captain, Christ, under whose colors he had fought so long. As surely as I live, sweet peace Lord, Appellant, your differences shall all rest on the gate till we assign you to your days of trial. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts thee heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him. And long live Henry of that name, the fourth. In God's name, I will send the good Mary, God forbid. Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard. Then true noblesse would learn him forbearance from so foul a rock. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged that they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them. And shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, Anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, for offended God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so heinous, black, obscene a deed. I speak to subject, and a subject speaks, stirred up by God thus boldly for his king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king. And if you crown him, let me prophesy, the blood of English shall manure the ground, and future ages groan for this foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels, and in this seat of peace, tumultuous wars shall kin with kin, and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skull. Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it, resist it, let it not be so, lest child, child's children cry against you. Whoa. Well have you argued, sir, and for your pains of capital treason we arrest you here. My Lord of Westminster, be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. May it please you, Lords, to grant the common suit. Fetch hither Richard, that in common view he may surrender, so we shall proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. Lords. You that here are under our arrest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little look for at your helping hand. Lack, why am I sent forth, my king? For I have shook off the legal thoughts wherewith I reign. I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee. If sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet I will remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry all hail to me? So Judas did to Christ, yet he in twelve found truth in all but one. 
I and twelve thousand none. God save the king. Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king, although I be not he. And yet, amen, if heaven will thank him. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that office of thine own goodwill, which tired majesty did make thee of. The resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin, seize the crown. Here, cousin, on this side my hand, and on that side your. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets filling one another. The empty are ever dancing in the air, the other down unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care by old care done. Your care is gain of care by new care won. The cares I give I have, though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no, no, I, for I Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight off my head. This unwieldy scepter from my hand. I the kingly sway from out my heart. In mine own tears I wash away my bar. With mine own hands I give away my crown. With mine own tongue deny my sacred state. With mine own breath release all duteous oaths. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forego. My acts, decrees and statutes I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that swear to me. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieve, and thou with all peace that hast all achieved. Long mayst thou live in Richard's seat to sit, and soon lie Richard in an earthy pit. God save King Harry! Unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine day. More, King. No more but that you read these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and profit of this land, that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthy of it. Must I so? And must I ravel out my weaved-up folly? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offences were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath marked with a blot, damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon, while at my wretchedness of fate myself, though some of you with Pilate wash your hands, showing an outward pity, yet you Pilates have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. My lord, dispatch, read all these articles. Mine eyes are full of tears I cannot see. And yet salt water blinds them not so much that they can see a sort of traitors here. Nay, if I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest. For I have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king. 
May glory base and sovereignty a slave, proud majesty a subject, state a peasant. My lord! No lord of thine, thou haught insulting man. No, no, no man's lord. I have no name, no title. No, not that name that given me a performance of two years and that the heavy day that I have worn so many winters out and know not now what name to call. Oh, that I were a mockery thing of snow standing before the sun of Bolingbroke to melt myself away in water. Good king, great king, and yet not great king. And if my word be sterling yet, let it command a mirror illustrate, that it may show me what the face I have since it is bankrupt of it. Oh, some of you in fact should. Read all this paper while the glass doth come. Heed, thou torment me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, my lord, nor tumble. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are written. And that's my sin. Give me the glass. And therein will I read. Sorrow struck so many blows upon this place of mine and made no peace Oh, flattering God. Like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof to keep ten thousand men? Was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink? Was this the face that faced so many follies? And was at last outpaced by Bolingbroke. A brittle glory shineth in his face. As brittle as the glory is the face, for there it is. Cracked in a hundred shivers. Silent King, the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my faith. The shadow of your sorrow has the shadow of your faith. Say that again. The shadow of my sorrow. Let's see. My grief lies all within. And these external manners of lament are merely shadows the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance. And I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty, that not only gives me cause to wail, but teaches me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon, and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it. Thank cousin. Fair cousin, I am greater than a king. For when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will. So I were from your sight. Go, some of you, convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Conveyors are you all. But rise thus nimbly. By a true king's fall. Oh. On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourself.
ancient have we here beheld? The world is to come. Children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as the dawn. You holy clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? Before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow, and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper, and I'll lay a plot shall show us all a merry day. Не пропусти самое нежное и душистое событие этого лета. Праздник цветов в Этномире. Наслаждайся солнцем и отличным настроением. Окунись в море красоты. Мастер-классы профессиональных флористов. Уникальные инсталляции и красочное шоу. Этномир. Букет улыбок. Категория 0+. The whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by proud Bolingbro. Here let us rest. If this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king and queen. But see, or rather do not, fair world. Yet look up, behold. That you in pity may dissolve to dew and wash him fresh again with true love too. Ah, thou the model of old Freud of Zion, thou Mephiboth, thou King Richard's tomb and not King Richard, thou most beauteous in, why should hard favored grief be lodged in thee, and triumph is become an alehouse death? Why not be grief? Fair woman, do not so to make my end too suffer. Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream from which awaked. The truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn, brother sweet, to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. I thee to France and cloister thee in some religious house. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown which our profane hours here have stricken down. What? Is my Richard both in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbroke deposed thy intellect? Hath he been in thy heart? The lion dying thrust forth his paw and wounds the earth if nothing else with rage to be your power. And wilt thou, pupil, take thy correction mildly, kiss the rod, and fawn on rage with base humility? Which art a lion and a king of beasts. A king of beasts indeed, if aught but beasts I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometime queen, prepare thee hence for France. Think I am dead, and that even here thou takest as from thy deathbed, thy last living leave. In winter's tedious nights, sit by the fire with good old folks, and let them tell thee tales of woeful ages long ago betid. And ere thou bid good night, to quit their griefs, tell thou the lamentable tale of me, and send the hearers weeping to them. For why the senseless brands will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue, and in compassion weep the fire out. And some will mourn in ashes, some coal black, or the deposing of a rightful king. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke is changed. You, Mr. Pomfret, not unto the tower. And, madam, there is aught attained for you. With all swift speed you must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder, where with all the mounting Bolingbroke ascends my throne. The time shall not be many hours of age more than it is, ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little helping him to all. And he shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, will know again, being ne'er so little urged, another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. Love of wicked friends converts to fear, and fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on my head, and there an end. 
Take leave and part, for you must part forthwith. Doubly divorced, bad men, ye violate a twofold marriage. Twixt my crown and me, and then betwixt me and my married wife. Let me unkiss the oath that's being leaned of the so for with a kiss to me. Part us not from the north. I towards the north, where shivering cold and sickness climb and climb. My wife, France, from whence set forth in pomp, he came and dawned hither like sweet May, sent back like hallow mass or short stood there. We must be the divine. Must be part. Ah, hand from hand, my love, and part from part. Banish us both and send the king with me. That was some love, but little policy. Then whither he goes, thither let me go. So two together weeping made one woe. Weep thou for me in France, I for thee here. Better far off than near, be near than near. So count thy way with sighs, I mine with woe. So long this way. Have the longest moment. Twice for one step I have been waiting for the peace the way out with a heavy heart. Come, come, and wooing sorrow lets me be. And wedding it there is such a leg to be. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly. Must give I mine and must take I. Give me my own again. For no good part to take on me to keep and kill them. Oh, now I have my own again. Be gone. That I may strive to kill it with a groan. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. Once more, adieu. Rest with sorrow. told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke, Drake Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, which his aspiring rider seemed to know with Slow but stately pace kept on his course, whilst all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolling. You would have thought the very window speak, so many greedy looks of young and old through casements darted their desiring eyes upon his visit, and that all the walls with painted imagery had said at once, Jeez, you preserve thee, welcome, Bolingbroke, whilst he from one side to the other turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, country. And thus, still doing thus, he passed along. Alack, poor Richard. Where rode he the whilst? As in a theatre, the eyes of men, after a well-graced actor leaves the stage, are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious, even so, or with much more contempt. Men's eyes did scowl on Richard. No man cried, God save him. No joyful tongue gave him his welcome home. But dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off, his face still combating with tears and smiles the badges of his grief and patience. Had not God for some strong purpose steeled the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted and barbarism itself have pitied you. Uh, heaven have a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm contents. To Bolingbroke are we sworn subjects now, whose state and honor I for I allow. Here comes my son, O'Merl. O'Merl that was, but that is lost for being Richard's friend. And madam, 
You must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledged for this truth and lasting fealty to the new maid. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the newcome spring? Madam, I know not, nor I greatly care not. God knows I had as lief been none as one. Well, fare you well in this new spring of time, lest you be cropped before you come to prime. What news from Oxford? Oh, those jests and triumphs. Lord, I know, my lord, they do. You will be there, I know. God prevent not, I purpose so. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Hmm. Looks thou pale? Let me see the writing. My lord, is nothing. No matter then who see it, I will be satisfied. Let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. It is a matter of small consequence, which for some reasons I would not have seen. Which for some reason, sir, I mean to see. Yeah. Yeah. What should you fear? It is nothing but some bond that he has entered into for gay apparel against the triumph. Bound to himself? What doth he with a bond that he is bound to wipe, thou art a fool boy? Let me see the right. I do beseech you, pardon me. I may not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see it. Reason. Foul. Treason. Felon. Traitor. Slave. What is the matter, my lord? Oh, who is it in there? Saddle my horse. God, for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why, what is it, my lord? Give me my boots. Saddle my horse. Now, by my honor, my life, my truth. I will appease the villain. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace. What is the matter, sir? Good mother, be content. It is no more than my poor life, my son. Thy life, answer. Bring me my boots. I will unto the king. Strike him, a man. Poor boy, thou art a Hence, villain, never more come in my sight. Give me my boots, I say. Why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more, son? Or do we like to have? Is not thy teeming gate drunk up with time? And wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like this? Is he not thine own? Thou fond mad woman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here obtain the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. Then what is that thing? Away, fond woman. Were he twenty times, my son, I would appeach him. Hadst thou grown for him as I had done, thou wouldst be more pitiful. But now I know thy mind. Thou dost suspect that I have been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard, not thy son. Sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be. Not like to me, nor any of thy kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman! After the man, mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king, and beg thy pardon, ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be long behind. Though I be old, I doubt not that you ride as fast as York, and never will I rise up from the ground till Bolling broke have pardoned thee. Away, be gone! Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? It's full three months since I did see him last. Any plague hang over us, tis he? I would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London, amongst the taverns there. For there they say he daily doth frequent with unrestrained, loose companions. Even such they say as stand in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers. Which he, young, wanton, effeminate boy, takes on the point of honor to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. And what said the gallant? His answer was he would enter the stews and from the commons creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favor. And with that he would unhorse the luckiest challenger. As dissolute as desperate. Yet through both I see some sparks of better hope which elder days may happily bring forth. But who comes here? Where is the king? What means our cousin that he stares and looks so wildly? God save your grace. I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Withdraw yourselves and leave us here alone. What is the matter with our cousin now? Forever may my knees grow to the earth 
my tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth, unless a pardon, ere I rise or speak, intended or committed was this fault. If on the first, how heinous ere it be to win thy after love, I pardon thee. Then give me leave that I may turn the key that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. My liege, beware! Look to thyself! Thou hast a traitor in thy presence there! Well, I'll make thee say. Stay thy revengeful hand, thou hast no cause to fear! Open the door! Till the fool hardy king, shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door! What is the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger that we may arm us to encounter it. Peruse this writing here. Thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. Remember as thou reads thy promise past. I do repent me. Read not my name there. My heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain, that thy hand did set it down. I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear. And not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to the heart. Oh, heinous, strong, and bold conspiracy. O loyal father of a treacherous son, thou sheer immaculate and silver fountain, from whence this stream through muddy passages hath held his current and defiled himself, Thy overflow of good converts the bad, and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy digressing son. So shall my virtue be his vice's board, and he shall spend my honor with his shame, as thriftless sons their scraping fathers go. Mine honor live when his dishonor die, for my shamed life in his dishonor lies. Thou killst me in his life, giving him breath, the traitor lives. A true man's put to death. For oh, God's sake, let me leave. What shrill voice softly makes this eager cry? A woman and thy own great king. He died. Speak with me. Pity me. Open the door. And make the bed. That's never been before. Our scene is altered from a serious thing and now changed to the beggar and the king. My dangerous cousin, let your mother in. I know she has come to pray for your foul sin. Thou do pardon whosoever pray. More sins for this forgiveness prosper me. This festered joint cut off the rest. Rest sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. Oh, king, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love, loving not itself. None other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dugs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Hear me, gentle. Rise up. Not yet, I may beseech. Forever will I walk upon my knees and never see day with the happy seas till thou give joy. Until thou bid me joy by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing. Unto my mother's prayers, I bend my knee. Against them both, my true joints bended be. Still mayst thou thrive, if thou grant any grace. Plead see in earnest. Look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears. His prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth. Ours from our breast. He prays with faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all the sound. His weary joints would gladly rise, I know. Our knees shall kneel till to the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first, and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach, pardon should be the first word of thy speech. I never longed to hear a word till now. Say pardon. Let people teach you now. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon, the king's mouth, so weak. 
Speak it in French, King. Say, pardonnez moi. Dost thou teach pardon, pardon to destroy? Ah, my sour husband, my hard-hearted lord, that sets the word itself against the word. Speak pardon, as it is current in our land, the chopping French we do not understand. Thine eye begins to speak. Set thy tongue there, or in my piteous heart, plant thou thine ear, that hearing how our plaints and prayers do pierce, pity may move thee, pardon to the Good aunt, stand up. What do not sue to stand? Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I, as God. Oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee. Yet when I sit still, speak it again. Twice saying pardon, but not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. I pardon him with all my heart. A God on earth, now. But for our trusty brother-in-law, the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, hope to order several powers to Oxford, or wherever these traitors are. They shall not live within this hour, I swear, but I will have them. I want to know where. Uncle, farewell. And cousin, adieu. Your mother well hath prayed, and prove you true. Ah, my old son. I pray God make me you. Didst thou not mark the king what words he spake? Have I no friend who will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? Those were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he? He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wistly looked on me as who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce this terror from my heart. Meaning the king at Pomfret. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend and will rid his foe. I have been studying how I may compare this prison that I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it up. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world. In humors like the people of this world, and no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples, and do set the word itself against the word, as thus, come, little one, and then again it is hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely one. Now these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison wall. And for they cannot die in their own pride. Thoughts tending to content that of themselves that they are not the first of fortune's slaves, nor shall not be the last. Like silly beggars who sitting in the stocks refuge their shame, that many have and others must sit there. And in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus play I in one person, many people, and none content. Sometimes am I king, and treason makes me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I king the game, and by and by, Think that I am unking by Bolingbrook, and straight am nothing. But whatever I be, for I am any man that that man is, that nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being. Music, do I hear? 
Ah, keep time. How sour sweet music is when time is broken, no proportion kept. So is it in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of the ear to check time broke in a disordered string. But for the concord of my state and time had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time. And now doth time waste me. And now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar their watches on unto mine eyes, the outward watch, whereto my finger, like a dial's point, is pointing still in cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sounds that tell what hour it is, are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart, which is the bell. So sighs and tears and groans show minutes times and hours, but my time runs posting on in Bolingbroke's proud joy, whilst I stand fooling here his deck of the clock. This music mads me, let it sound no more, although it has hope madmen to their wit. In me it seems it will make wise men mad. Yet, pressing on his heart, and love the Richard with the strange growth of this all-taking world. Cheapest of us is ten growth too dear. What art thou? How comest thou hither where no man ever comes but that sad dog that brings me food to make misfortune live? I was a poor groom of thy stable, King. In thou wert king, who, travelling towards York, with much ado at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face. Oh, how it yearned my heart when I beheld in London streets that coronation day when Bolingbroke rode on Roan Barbary, that horse that thou so often hast bestrid, that horse that I so carefully have dressed. Tell me, gentle friend, how went he under him? So proudly as if he disdained the ground. The proud that Bolingbroke was on his bed. That jade have ate bread from my royal hand. This hand has made him proud with clapping him. Would he not stumble? Would he not fall down since pride must have a fall? and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back. Forgiveness, horse, why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, was born to bear? I was not made a horse, and yet I bear a burden like an ass, spurred, galled, and tired by jouncing Bolingbroke. Fellow, give place. Here is no longer stay. Thou love me. It's time now. What my tongue dares not, that my heart shall say. My lord, will please you to fall too. Taste of it first, as thou art wont to do. My lord, I dare not. Sir Pierce of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the contrary. The devil take Henry of Lancaster and thee! Patience is stale, and I am weary of thee! Help! 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 Oh, what be in this rude assault? Fill my own hand, yield thy death's instrument. Go thou and find another room in hell. Ah, uh, the hand shall burn in never quenching fire that staggers thus my person. Next, thy fierce hand hath the king's blood. Gained the king's own land. Mount, mount, my soul. Thy seat is up on high. Whilst my gross flesh sinks down. As full of valor as of royal blood. Oath have I spilled. Oh, would. Deed were good, for 
now the devil that told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest and give them burial here. Uncle York, the latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Sicester in Gloucestershire. But whether they be taken or slain, we hear not. Welcome, my lord. What is the news? First, to thy sacred stage, I wish all happiness. The next news is, I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salisbury, Blunt, and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear at large in this case. We thank the good person, And thy worth will add to my worthy. My lord, I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brocus and Sir Bennet Seeley, two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains, Fitzwater, shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit. Well, I want. The grand conspirator, Abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlyle, living to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out from a secret place and reverend you more than thou hast, and with it joy thy life. So as thou wouldst in peace. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, I spark so far. Great King, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Excellent! I thank thee not. For thou hast wrought a deed of slaughter with thy faithful hand upon my head. And all this fearless man. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need, nor do I thee. Though I do wish him death, I hate the murderer. Love him, murderer. But this recordance take thou for thy good. But neither my good woman. With Cain, go wander, color fades of night, and never show thy head by day nor night. Lord, I protest my stories of the world, that blood should sprinkle and make me good. Come, mourn with me, for that I do remember. I'll make a voyage to the holy man to wash this blood off from my guilty head. March sadly after, grace my mornings here, in weeping after this untimely. 